So the interpretation right here is, I don't know exactly what the population mean of ages of people being denied promotion is. I don't know what the population is for this company. I guess my sample's only 23, right? I don't know what the population mean is. But I'm, how, how, what percent sure are we? 95% sure that it's gonna fall between these ages. So here's what this means for this company. You're 95% sure that the people who are being denied a promotion are between 43 and 50, oh, 44, 44 and 50, right? That's, is that older than normal? I don't know, that's, that's for someone else to decide, but you can provide them that information. Okay, so it says, is this significantly different than like people being denied a promotion at 30? Yeah, absolutely. Most of these people, 95% of the people are being, or you're 95% sure that most of these people are gonna have an average age of uh, somewhere between 44 and 50, that's, that's older than, if that's older than all the other people get promotions, then that would, they'd probably be in big trouble right there. But at least now you can find the, the, the interpretation and give the information to someone else to make those decisions. So again, the, the interpretation is, I don't know exactly what the population average is of people being denied promotion, but I'm 95% sure it's going to fall within this range. That's the idea. How many people understood this example? Good deal. Very, very similar to before, right? Only difference is that T. That T is crucial, though. You've got to know when to use it. If you have the sigma, perfect. You got Z. If you don't have the sigma, you got S. You got T. Computation is exactly the same. Finding the numbers are a little bit different. Though. Notice that if you used a, if you did use a z-score, you're going to be pretty close, right? You're going to be pretty close to this, but it's going to be off right here by just a little bit. Just a little bit, and just a little bit, that's not, that's not good enough for us. We need to be pretty, pretty precise on this stuff. If you used a z, it would be 1.96. That's not all that different. That's only different in the hunt well, about a tenth and a, a tenth, 11 hundredths difference. Not much, but it will make a difference. Okay, last thing we can do here before we do one final example. Just like before, when we had a, a confidence interval, you should be able to break that up and find the, the X bar like we found the P hat, and find the E like we found the E last time. And really, it was all just about whether you can take, to find X bar, the two bounds, add them together, and divide them by two, basically averaging them. Do you remember doing that with the P hat? Do you? Hopefully you do. To find the, the X bar, X bar is right in between these two numbers. So if I add them up and divide by two, if I average them, it's going to give me X bar. So you take the upper, <coughs> minus the lower, divide by two. To find E, you take the upper, I'm sorry, plus the lower. I, I messed that up. I uh, do upper plus lower. I think I said plus, I broke minus. Minus the lower and divide by two. So in our case here, we take 27.218 plus 24.065 and divide by 2. That's going to give me x bar, whatever that is. To find the E, the maximum difference between those, that margin of error, you take the 27.218, you subtract the 24.065, and you divide by 2. And that's going to give you your E. Is that clear enough for you? You go ahead and do, do the math on your own. That's simple mathematics, uh, but that's about, about all we can do. We'll do one more example on this next time. So we're doing one last example about confidence intervals. This is, this is it, folks. After this, we get into hypothesis testing, and we are rolling. Good stuff after this. So in a random sample of babies born to cocaine-using mothers, the average weight was found to be 2,700 grams with a standard deviation of 645 grams. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the population average birth weight. The first thing we got to do is determine what section of confidence intervals we're in. Are we dealing with proportions here? Is there anything to do with success versus failure? Anything like that? No, we're not calling, you know, cocaine baby success. That's a horrible, horrible thing. So that's, that's not good. So we, we don't have successes versus failures. We don't have any sort of proportion. We have averages going on. You with me? So we're talking about averages. So instead of dealing with proportions, we're over here in this section averages. And in averages, we have one of two categories. We have, we know the population standard deviation or we don't know the population standard deviation. If we read through this, let's try to identify some things here. Firstly, the most important thing is do you have, a, well, do you have a standard deviation? Does it say that? Yes. You have, you're going to have a standard deviation. 
in these problems. It's just you need to determine whether it's the population or the sample. If it's the population standard deviation, it will say specifically the population standard de deviation is assumed to be, or assume the population standard deviation is somewhere, it's going to say population standard deviation up, up there. Does that say that here? No. So do we know the population standard deviation? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. What is this standard deviation then? So is that sigma or S? S? That is S. That is exactly right. So we know a few things right now. Firstly, do you know, let's see, um, oh, you know what, I didn't tell you what the sample size was. Uh, sample of, let's say, 190. Hundred ninety babies. Babies. Do you know N? What does N stand for? Sample size. Sample size. Great. So N is one ninety. Do you know the mu? Do you know the mu? No. Why not? Why don't we know the mu? <laughs> hey. If you knew the mu, you wouldn't even be doing this problem because you would know the mu. Right now what you're trying to do is estimate the mu. Are you clear on that? Why would you be estimating the mu if you knew the mu? That, that'd just be silly. That, that'd be dumb. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that. So of course we don't know the mu. That's what we're trying to estimate. So we, we don't know that. What do we know? Good. How much is x bar? And of course that came from the sample then average was 2,700, okay. And you said we knew sigma or we knew S, which one? S. Okay. Sure, the 645, that is our, our S. Now is the time when you determine whether you're going to be using a Z-score or a T-score, and it's all based right here. It's not based on this. It's not based on this. It's based on what that letter is. If that's a sigma, what do you use? If, if that was a sigma, the candle, what you use a Z. Is that a sigma? No, it's an S. What do you use now? T score. T score. That's the determination. I walked you through that last part of class, right? I had you follow that chart down. So this is this is S. That means we're going to be using a, a T critical value. But there's one more thing that we need that we don't need with a Z, that we do need with a, a T. What is it? So that's right under here, degrees of freedom. What is it? Okay, that's our first step. Identify all these letters. I think we have all of them listed. The next thing we got to do, find your critical value. So this is like step one, check to make sure your, your requirements are met. Step two is let's see if we can find our T, in this case, critical value. By the way, what is your... .01. Wow, I didn't even finish it. Because you're good today. You're on top of the, on top of the game. Yeah, .01 is your alpha. That's the complement of your confidence level. So we got 0 .01, that's stemming from a 99% confidence interval. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Very good. Now, take out your tables. Okay. We're going to look at this together. Look over at that table, and these numbers are kind of kind of small. I'll zoom in in just a moment. Your degrees of freedom was listed on the left. You should have used this column a whole lot last homework, right? That you, that you just used. By the way, did they throw in any Z scores or were they all T scores? They threw in some Z scores. Did they throw in some Z's? At the beginning. Just to, for you to determine between, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then all the problems should have had to do with T score. If you use Z-score on your homework, I mean, you better take that homework back today and change that. <laughs> so over here on the left-hand side, we start seeing these, these degrees of freedom. But, but down here, past 40, notice past 40 how it, it goes up by 5, and then by 10, and then ultimately by 100. Do you see that? Yeah. That's because as you're getting closer and closer to these large sample sizes, your T-score is really starting to approximate your z-score, right? And, and so it's getting really, really close. And so they can afford to make these jumps. I mean, look at that. Between 90 and 100 is only off by four, 
thousandths, that's not much. Between a thousand and two thousand is only off by two thousandths. That's not much at all. Okay? That's only a little, little bit. So the, the difference between sample sizes as you get really large doesn't make that much of a difference. So whether we have a degrees of freedom of 189 or two, what, what was our degrees of freedom? Wasn't it 189? If we had a degrees of freedom of 189 versus a degrees of freedom of 200, is it really going to make that much of a difference? Not, not really. I mean, those things are very close sample size wise. So when you have a degrees of freedom that's not listed specifically on your chart, small sample size, yes, it matters a whole bunch. One, being off by one when you're way up there makes really different T values, T critical values. But down here it doesn't. So when you're dealing with like 189, what's 189 closer to, 100 or 200? 200. Pick the 200. Okay, pick the 200. So, by the way, looking back at the top, can you read which column we're in? Are we in this column? No, that would be an 80% confidence interval. That's the area of two tails. This one would be a 90%. Yes? This would be a 95%. True? This would be a 90, 98%. That's a 98% confidence interval right there. This is your 99. Why do we say that? There's, there's your alpha right there. Didn't I put off to the side that this was alpha and this is alpha over 2 for you? So if this is our alpha, we have 0.01. That's why I had you run on the board. You're going to go all the way down, do this on your table, look up your alpha in correspondence with the appropriate degrees of freedom, which everyone's closest to, and then give me my T critical value. Do that on your own. Don't say it loud. Have everyone do it. And what is it? How many were able to find <coughs> Now, just to refresh your memory, if we deal with a 99% confidence interval with a Z score, this is 2.575. That number should be like in your head, right? So this is going to be a little bit wider than a 99% confidence interval with Z score. That would be if we had known the population standard deviation. So here it's a little bit wider because we don't know that. We don't know the spread of the population. What now? Formula for margin of error. Margin of error. Great. So find me your E. That's that one. Really, from here on out, it's just plugging in numbers. Honestly, the key part in doing this is knowing whether you use T or C. That's it. Have you found your E? Have you found your E? 645 divided by the square root of 190, then you multiply that by 2.601 in this particular case, and you get how much? 121.75. Wait, what, what again? No, what was the first part? 121.71. Now that seems kind of large, but when you think about it, the, I mean the average weight was 2,700 grams, right? That's, that's large, with a standard deviation of 645. So your margin of error when you do with means can be almost anything there. It just depends on what your, your context is. What do you do now? Do you leave it? No.